welcome back to Poetry Revival. This is episode three, which is actually part two of episode two, How to Read a Poem. And so this is the continuation of How to Read a Poem, except we're going to focus on a concept known as the intentional fallacy. And I'll give you more history into that as time goes on. For now, Welcome back to Poetry Revival. My name is AJ. If you have trouble remembering my name, AJ, just think of appetite for jesting or, or for jousting. I need to begin with an apology for you. This is episode three, and it was supposed to be out about two months ago. As you recall, in episode two, I dedicated that to my friend Jeremy Barnhart, but when I recorded that, he had only been dead for about a week. And uh, I recorded it, and I started doing the uploading of slides and stuff like that, and then I just I stopped working. I wasn't able to keep going. And it took me a total of about two months to get that episode up, and so this episode is also two months late as a result. And my apologies for that. I just was not able to accomplish anything during that time. A friend's death can have a serious impact on a person. It's, um, it's quite profound. At the same time, though, as devastated as I was by his death, I am impressively recovered from it. I, I am amazed by how quickly I have been able to recover. And so I feel good about that. And anyway, onward to episode three. So today... In continuation of how to read a poem, we are talking about the intentional fallacy. The intentional fallacy is a philosophy of reading literature that says it is a mistake to read a poem and try to interpret that poem by trying to gain the author's intentions for the poem. That is the intentional fallacy. If you're reading a poem and you want to see how you understand it, but you want to check your own understanding by what the author may have intended for that poem, that's wrong. And I'm going to share with you about 22 reasons why that is wrong, why you shouldn't do that. Now, having said that, we got to clear some things up before we begin. So we're going to be getting into some terminology here. We need to clear up the difference between the author intentions, and the author's purpose. There are five different purposes that an author may use in writing. What was his purpose in writing such and such a story or such and such an article or a poem or a novel, whatever the case may be? What is the author trying to do as far as purpose? Now, there are only five choices, perhaps more, but they're very limited. The author may be trying to entertain. The author may be trying to inform. The author may be trying to persuade. The author may be trying to describe. Or finally, the author might be trying to ascribe, to give credit to somebody for something. Those are the purposes and that's not what we're talking about when we're discussing author intentions. When we're talking about author intention, we are talking about the meaning of a work that is attributed to the author of that work. In other words, you're reading a work and you're trying to figure out what the author meant in saying this, that, or the other thing. And if it's dealing with a poem, you could be t dealing with a line of that poem, you could be dealing with a full stanza, or you could be dealing with a couple of stanzas, or, or you could be dealing with the entire poem. So that's the distinction between author intention and purpose. When I talk about interpretation of a poem, or any other work of art, for that matter, we're talking about the attainment of meaning of a work of art. So what does this poem mean? What does this painting mean? What does the painting tell us? What does it teach us? That's what we're looking at for interpretation. And also the word critique is used often in this episode. Critique, interpretation, they're almost interchangeable. Almost. 
But anytime you are writing an essay, talking about a poem, trying to describe what it means and to give some background information and describe the poem, that is a critique. When we're talking about critique, we're not trying to say, we're not trying to just say, well, this poem is bad or this poem is good or successful or not successful. That's not what we're interested in for critiquing. When we're talking about critiquing, we are talking about interpreting. Same thing. We're talking about giving your understanding of the poem. That's what interpretation is. Therefore, that's what critiquing is. Even an explication, which is describing line by line what a poem means, grammatically and aesthetically, that's still a critique. These are all forms of critiquing. So whether I say interpret or understand or explicate or critique, it's all the same thing. The main point of this episode is this. As long as your interpretation of a poem, in this case, is supported by the text of that poem, your interpretation is good, it's accurate, it's fine the way it is. You don't need to worry about author intentions at all. Forget them. We're talking about your interpretation of the poem. So the caveat is that the poem itself must support your interpretation. And we'll talk about some examples of that near the end of the podcast. But for now, let's just think, you know, you're, you're reading the novel Huckleberry Finn. And you're trying to argue that it's a love story between Huckleberry Finn and his romantic inclinations toward the Mississippi River, where he's madly in love with the river, and he kisses it and longs for it and all that kind of good thing. The text would not support that interpretation, so that interpretation would not be valid. But if you're talking about Huckleberry Finn and you're describing that book in a way that describes the relationship between Huckleberry Finn and his friend going down the river with him, and I've just had his name in my head and it's gone now, but you know who I mean. That might be a very good interpretation that's supported by the text. So that's the caveat. An interpretation must be supported by the text that it's interpreting. All right, so some history now. You'll have to pardon me. I will be reading this. I don't want to sound like I'm reading, but uh, I want to make sure I'm clear. And so in order to be clear, I'm going to be reading so that I don't miss anything, so that I don't misspeak, just to make sure that I am clear and accurate. But I'll try to sound like I'm not reading. The early part of the 20th century opened with a new era in literature, which is known as New Criticism. Part of this movement was the interpretation of literature based solely on the work itself rather than on historical or cultural contexts, rather than on reader responses, or rather than on author intentions. So exclude historical or cultural contexts, exclude your response as a reader to a certain work, and exclude author intentions, those three things. The movement wasn't fully accepted until about 1946 or thereafter, when one critic named W.K. Wimsatt, together with a philosopher named M.C. Beardsley, published their seminal essay called The Intentional Fallacy. The Intentional Fallacy is the essay that actually made new criticism in the early part of the century valid, and that's why it's so important. As I said, this essay is not a discussion of a fallacy that you intend to use in an argument, as the title suggests. Rather, it refers to a fallacy of considering the poet's intentions as a basis in the discussion of that poem. When I say the word poem here, I'm not necessarily talking about a poem. It can be a story. It can be uh, any other work of art, pictorial art, sculpture, even uh, classical music, and uh, song lyrics, for that matter. Wimsatt and Beardsley were speaking specifically about poetry, 
And so I'll use the term poetry a lot, but every time you hear poetry, just apply that to any work of art, as far as I'm concerned. Unless I say, oh, this doesn't really apply to such and such a form of art, which I do once or twice. It is a demonstration of why critics, such as students, readers, lovers of poetry, should not at all be concerned about what the poet may have intended when interpreting a work of literature. The intentional fallacy argues strongly and soundly against considering a poet's intentions as a premise for a literary critique. In this episode, I'm going to discuss Wimsott and Beardsley's reasons, but for the purpose of this video, I'm calling attention to this idea for the benefit of helping people learn to read and enjoy poetry without the undue burden of trying to find and decipher an author's intentions for a work of literature. I will highlight Wim Sutton Beardsley's points, and I'll discuss other people's added points, and even my own as well. So this video is not necessarily a scholarly discussion. It's a discussion of passion on my part. I want people to begin to enjoy poetry again. My mission for this podcast is to do all I can to help people understand and appreciate poetry again. The supposed need to apply the poet's intentions to the interpretation of a poem is one important thing that detracts from people being able to appreciate poetry. For that reason alone, we should do away with it. But I have yet to find a bad reason to ignore author intentions or artist intentions for appreciating any work in any genre of the arts at all. What you see in any poem, as long as it's supported by the text in question, is what the poem means. This notion is supported by Wim Sutton Beardsley among a plethora of other professors, writers, and scholars, and myself included. I would consider myself one of all three of those, professor, writer, and scholar. The first step in enjoying a poem is to enjoy the flippin' poem, not to try to decipher what the author might have intended. It is important that people learn to enjoy poetry as they did in previous centuries, as they appreciate movies and novels today. One way to help readers do that is to unburden them of impossible and unnecessary details. And to do that, I want to disabuse people of thinking that their individual ideas in their own understanding of a poem are less valid than anyone else's, including the poets. I'm going to say that again because it's important. I want to disabuse people of thinking that their individual ideas in their own understanding of a poem are less valid than anyone else's, including the poets. Now, as I said before, when I was teaching, I never assigned the essay called The Intentional Fallacy as a reading assignment. I would if I were teaching a master's class, perhaps, in literature. Uh, but for any undergraduate student, no, absolutely not. It's That would be torture, not education. And I'm an educator, not a what do you call a person who tortures someone else? A torturer? Anyway. But do understand this. Even though I would not assign people to read it, I stand firmly behind the notion of the intentional fallacy. I need you to understand that. Now, in their article, pretty close to the beginning of it, Wimsot and Beardsley give five reasons to not use author intentions as a standard for judging or interpreting a work of literature. Now I'm going to put these principles in their words up in slides on the screen. I'll read them and then talk about them with you. Okay, the first of Wim Sutton Beardsley's principles is this one. A poem does not come into existence by accident. The words of a poem, as Professor Stahl has remarked, 
come out of a head, not out of a hat. Yet, to insist on the designing intellect as a cause of a poem is not to grant the design or intention as a standard. Okay, so what are they trying to say here? For those of you who are well-read in poetry and well-versed in, in the intentional fallacy, I uh, welcome your input in the comments, of course. I'm trying to reinterpret these principles for the novice. And so if I miss something, please let me know. My understanding of that first principle, though, is that when you acknowledge the cause and origin of a literary work as the human intellect, that is not the same as suggesting that the intellect and the intentions of a work are the same, or the design or intentions are the, at all a standard for understanding a literary work. That is to say, the design or intention of a work is not a way to understand the work. It has nothing to do with understanding it. So what, what the author may have intended has nothing to do with what you understand from reading the work of a poem. They're two completely separate things. The second of Wimsot and Beardsley's principles reads as follows. One must ask how a critic expects to get an answer to the question about intention. How is he to find out what the poet tried to do? If the poet succeeded in doing it, then the poem itself shows what he was trying to do. And if the poet did not succeed, then the poem is not adequate evidence, and the critic must go outside the poem for evidence of an intention that did not become effective in the poem. Only one caveat must be borne in mind, says an eminent intentionalist in a moment when his theory repudiates itself. The poet's aim must be judged at the moment of the creative act, that is to say, by the art of the poem itself. So this second principle asks a question, essentially. How do you find out what an author intended from a certain work? It may be that an author recorded something about his or her intentions, but it's not likely. In fact, such a thing seldom exists, especially for older literature. To Trying to find something like that would really be an exercise in wasting time. So how else can you find out about it? Well, if it's a good poem, it's well written, and it seems successful in achieving its own goal, then you could use the poem itself, which, of course, is what you're trying to do in the first place. If the poem is not successful, then you can't use the poem either, so you have no way of finding out what the poet intended for that poem at all. But, William Sutton Beardsley say, there is one last thing you need to keep in mind, and this is from someone who says, you must keep the author intentions in mind. But suddenly he realizes that his argument doesn't work. Okay, so this intentionalist, this person who believes in using author intentions, says, then the poet's intentions must be judged by the poet itself, which is exactly what William Sutton Beardley were arguing to begin with. So even the intentionalist, the person who believes in using author intentions, even he says, well, if you can't find it, then use the poem. So in that case, the intentionalist is arguing in favor of Wimsod and Beardsley, who argue against what the intentionalist normally would be arguing. Okay, Wimsod and Beardsley's third point. Judging a poem is like judging a pudding or machine. One demands that it work. It is only because an artifact works that we infer the intention of the artificer. A poem should not mean but be. A poem can only be through its meaning, since its medium is words, yet it simply is in the sense that we have no excuse for inquiring what part is intended or meant. Poetry is a feat of style by which a 
complex of meaning is handled all at once. Poetry succeeds because all of what is said or implied is relevant. What is irrelevant has been excluded, like lumps from pudding and bugs from machinery. So what is this telling us? In a poem, you give yourself rules for writing. The more rules you give, the more you are forced to be creative. I am not impugning the writers of short fiction or of novels. I am not impugning their work at all. However, I recall this from my first episode, one of the things that separates poetry from prose is the implementation of abundant rules. You have rhythm, you have line length as far as syllables go, you have rhyme, perhaps, you have all kinds of other things that you want to include. Sometimes you have a formula, like a sonnet, that you have to follow. All of these things are rules that you are burdening yourself with as a poet so that you can be creative. And in doing that, you must remove everything that is not absolutely important. So the bugs have been worked out in a work of poem by the time it is complete. The lumps from the pudding, unless it's tapioca, of course, the lumps from the pudding have been removed. I would prefer lumps from gravy myself. They've been removed. It's nice, creamy, no extra stuff in a poem. That's the essence of poetry to one degree. So everything that's there is, in fact, intended. In fact, we could go one step further. Everything that's in a poem is imperative for the meaning of that poem. There is nothing in the poem that should not be there or can be removed. Wimsot and Beardsley's fourth principle, the meaning of a poem may certainly be a personal one, in the sense that a poem expresses a personality or state of soul rather than a physical object like an apple. But even a short lyric poem is dramatic. The response of a speaker, no matter how abstractly conceived, to a situation, no matter how universalized. We ought to impute the thoughts and attitudes of the poem immediately to the dramatic speaker, and if to the author at all, only by a biographical act of inference. Okay, so what are they telling us here? They're saying that in every poem, whether it tells a story, and we'll be talking about these in the next episode, whether it tells a story or whether it is a work of drama or whether it is simply a personal lyrical message where one is maybe talking to someone, but that person is not there. It's like a love letter or a, a journal entry. There is still a speaker who is not the poet. You can never assume that the poet is the one speaking in the poem. It might be, but we would have no way of knowing. So it goes to the speaker who is separate from the poet. Any intentions of that poem, then, if we have them, go to the speaker in the poem, not to the poet. Unless, such as in the case of uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. A lot of his poems are interpreted in, and can be interpreted in such a way as to express his own grief for the loss of his friend, Arthur Henry Hallam. Let me explain this. These two people were friends in the early part of university days. Arthur Hallam died at the age of 24 when he was on a trip away from Tennyson at the point. Um, Tennyson was all ready to, you know, give his daughter in marriage to this friend of his. He was looking forward to being the uncle of his friend's son uh, or daughter. He had high hopes for this friendship in the future. They were both poets. They were both philosophers in that regard. And Hallam died. Tennyson was devastated by this. But you can see in his poetry that when he invents a persona, there are parallels strong parallels between that persona and Tennyson's biography, 
So when he invents the character Ulysses, for example, and he talks to his friends who have all died, you can hear at the same time Tennyson talking to Hallam, even though we are reading Ulysses talking to his mariners, his friends, his fellow sailors. But you don't take a look at the poem and say, this is Tennyson saying, hey, Arthur, let's get together again. It doesn't work that way because there's no indication in the poem of Ulysses that his mariners had died. In fact, the opposite seems true. Even though they did die in the, in the literature on which that poem is based, the mariners were dead by the time Ulysses would have had a chance to make this, this statement to his mariners. But he talks to them as though they're still alive. So it doesn't quite work to interpret the poem through Tennyson's eyes. You can do it through Ulysses' eyes, and you can see the biographical parallels. That's not the interpretation, though. It's just an interesting component to Tennyson's poetry. If you have questions on that, please don't hesitate to ask in the comments. I'd be happy to try to address them. Okay, Wim Sutton Beardsley's final numbered principle for interpreting poems and avoiding the intentional fallacy. Number five, if there is any sense in which the author, by revision, has better achieved his original intention, it is only the very abstract, tautological sense that he intended to write a better work and now has done it. In this sense, every author's intention is the same. His former specific intention was not his intention. He's the man we were in search of, that's true says Hardy's Rustic Constable. This is a reference to Thomas Hardy's characters, one in specifically, but it's a general type of thing as well. And yet he's not the man we were in search of, for the man we were in search of was not the man we wanted. Okay, what's being said here? Let's dissect the second part first, where he's quoting Thomas Hardy. What's going on here is that you have a constable who is finding a murderer, and he thinks it's John Blonde who did it. And so he goes after chasing John Blonde. But before he gets to John Blonde, he realizes that John Blonde is not the right man. It was Frank Zink who's the real murderer. And so the man he was in search of, John Blonde, was not the man he wanted because he wanted Frank Zink. He just didn't know that while he was chasing John Blonde. So that's what's being said in that part. But the, the first part of this principle asks the question, when has an author achieved his intention? Is it in the first draft of a poem? Or is it only in the final draft? You have to ask yourself why a poet revises, why he would make changes once he's completed a poem. There are myriad reasons a poet revises. There could be quite legitimately errors in the poem, not necessarily grammatic, but those in, as well. Maybe he counted the rhythm wrong. Maybe he tried to get an idea down in the four line stanza that he's been using the rest of the poem, but in this one stanza, he's got five lines. He's got to fix that, blah, 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 blah. Maybe he wants stronger verbs here. Maybe he wants a different rhyme. There are all kinds of things that can be going on. So when is the intention fulfilled? Well, if he did do it in an early draft, he has redone it in the final draft. But this goes back to the second principle. If he's done it in the final draft, then you have the final draft as evidence for what he intended. So it circles around and around. The idea for revision is not necessarily intention. The idea for revision is complete the beauty of the words. Make the poem musical, make it beautiful, make it reflective. The intention may have already been accomplished. Okay, going on with other principles, the sixth one is still from Wimsot and Beardsley, but when I stumbled on it as I was reading the article, I, I could not allow myself to pass over it and not include it. It reads as follows. Is not a critic, asks Professor E. E. Stahl, a judge who does not explore his own consciousness but determines the author's meaning or intention as if the poem were a will, a contract, or the Constitution? The poem is not the critic's own. 
he has diagnosed very accurately two forms of irresponsibility, one which he prefers, our view is different. The poem is not the critic's own and not the author's. It is detached from the author at birth and goes about the world beyond his power to intend about it or control it. So, when Sutton Beardsley are saying that this Professor E.E. E. Stoll said that the poem is not the critic's own, and Wim Sutton Beardsley said, yeah, that's, that's true, but it's also not the poet's. Once a poem is published, it belongs to whoever reads it. It is no longer the poet's, except through copyright purposes. In other words, John Doe wrote a poem, I can't claim that I wrote it, especially after it's published, because there's proof, right? That would be stupid on my part, and it would be stealing. But it doesn't belong to the poet in such a way that the meaning remains only the poet's. The meaning of the poem does not belong to the poet. Therefore, the poem itself cannot belong to the poet. Okay, principle number seven is so long that I had to divide it into two parts. I will read the entire thing here. It's, it is the first paragraph in an essay by a person whose name is Nazrula Mambrol. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not. This was published in March of 2016. Mambrol says, One of the critical concepts of new criticism, intentional fallacy, was formulated by Wim Sutton Beardsley in an essay in The Verbal Icon in 1946 as the mistake of attempting to understand the author's intentions when interpreting a literary work, claiming that it is fallacious to base a critical judgment about the meaning or value of a literary work on external evidences concerning the author's intention. Wim Sutton Beardsley held that the design or intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of literary art. It is closely associated with the new critical notion of the autotectic text, according to which the meaning of a work is contained solely within the work itself, and any attempt to understand the author's intentions violates the autonomy of the work. T.S. Eliot, in Tradition and the Individual Talent, had argued that honest criticism and sensitive appreciation are directed not upon the poet, but upon the poetry. Stylistically, as well as conceptually, intentional fallacy was against the romantic conception of literature as a vehicle of impersonal expression, with the entry of structuralism and post structuralism into the literary arena, literature began to be seen as purely linguistic artifact, and intentional fallacy was strongly endorsed with the Barthesian concept of the death of the author. Now, to fully understand that, we need to talk about principle number eight, and that is, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name, but I think it's Barthes. And in any event, this person argues against traditional literary practice of relying on intentions and biography of an author to obtain the ultimate meaning of a text. Instead, the essay emphasizes an ultimate importance on each reader's interpretation over any author's intended meaning, a process in which subtle or unnoticed characteristics may be drawn out for new insight. Both Mambrol and Barthes, in Principles 7 and 8, are saying the same thing. It is up to the individual reader, not the writer, to interpret the poem. That is not to say that the author cannot read his own poem and come away with an understanding, but that understanding of the author is not to be burdensome to the readers. Let the readers have their own understanding. Essentially, the poet's interpretation, even the poet's intentions, are merely interpretations that can be set aside entirely, just like anybody else's. Critiquing a work based on author intentions limits the creativity of every reader. In other words, if the author intentions are that important, then every critic who reads a poem is going to be saying, well, this is what the poet meant to say, 
not what I think it says. You have distinctly gutted the very purpose for art, and that is for the person viewing or reading or hearing to say, oh, I get this because of this part of my life or that part of my life or this occurrence in my life. This is how I apply it to me. You're denying the person the ability to do that if the author intentions are that integral. And they are not. I really must comment also, just for the sake of my own humor, Barthes's essay, The Death of the Author, was in French. In French, it reads, La mort de Arthur, The Death of the Author. La mort de l'Arthur. My French is awful. Please forgive me. But it does ring to mind the very famous medieval poem, also in French, Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur. I, one sounds like it's imitating the others. Barthes is advocating for the death of the author when it comes to interpreting a work of literature, whereas Le Mort d'Arthur is lamenting the death of Arthur, but the two titles sound very much alike. If I understand enough about French, Mort d'Arthur is one death of one person. So it's just mort d'Arthur. However, the death of the author, the, the word author in French is either very generalized or could be interpreted as being plural. So it's the single death of the authors, as I understand it. That's how I would think about translating it if I knew more about French. So I'm not going to go into that too much more detail. When I have translated poems from French into English, and I have, I did so with a great deal of help because I'm just not that fluent. The uh, next two principles, both still come from the same author, Mambrol, from his key theories regarding the intentional fallacy. Uh, the next one, number nine, reads as this. The poem is an autonomous verbal structure which has its end in itself, which has no purpose beyond its own existence as an aesthetic object. It is not answerable to criteria of truth, accuracy of representation, of imitation, or morality. Okay, so what's he saying here? There's nothing outside the poem that is needed to understand the poem. The poem itself is all there is when you're understanding a poem. You can't judge it by how true it is. You can't judge it by how it represents something. You can't judge it based on its morality. It's a work of art. You look at it as art, and that's all. In the last one by the same author, number 10, as an object of public language, the poem is available to the public for interpretation. The author has no privileged claim over language, and his word outside of the poem cannot be taken as somehow authoritative. Wimsot and Beardsley acknowledge that the author can offer useful practical advice for a would-be poet, but such advice falls under the psychology of composition rather than criticism. And I would agree with this. I, th I th would take it one step further. So in the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, the persona, the speaker in the poem, describes a road that diverges in the middle of a forest. One of them is very well taken, very well trotted, very popular, apparently, based on how much dirt and gravel there is, rather than the other one, which has a lot more growth on it. Now, Robert Frost tells us that when he was writing about this, he was talking about whether he should become a poet or become a lawyer. And that's all fine and dandy. That gives us some historical context and a way of appreciating the poem. But it's not necessary for understanding the poem. If I hadn't heard that by Robert Frost about what he was trying to write, what was going on in his life when he was writing, I could still interpret the poem just fine for myself. And I would still probably come up with something very similar because the metaphors that are used are very clear and common on their own. You're talking about a road that often t deals with walking life. The fact that it's a yellow wood. Well, it's 
the dying time of year. So it's somewhat late in life. There's an urgency for making a decision. You've got one road or you've got another road. The fork in the road is a cliche almost. I'm glad he didn't say fork in the road. Uh, he didn't even say crossroads. Uh, the principle is all there for me to interpret the poem without knowing that Robert Frost was experiencing a certain crisis while he wrote that poem. It becomes irrelevant because the poem is so beautifully intelligent and clear all on its own. So once again, even though I know this wonderful thing about Robert Frost's life in regard to this poem, I don't need it to appreciate the poem at all. Going on now, these are additional reasons, and these are reasons that I have collected over the years. I have not kept a record as to who said it. Sometimes they just come from teachers. Sometimes they're my own ideas. Sometimes they come from other students, classmates of mine. Maybe I read them here or there. Whatever the case may be, I have collected them and uh, have not given any credit to what they are, just the, the ideas themselves. But they all work together uh, for the same principle. Forget author intentions. And so I'm going to go through these each one at a time under uh, the category of additional reasons. And if somebody out there knows of one of these principles that was said by, you know, the poet Booby Hooby, you know, in, in 1958, whatever, please let me know. And I would like to be able to add credit to that in some way. But uh, for the most part, I just have collected these at random without giving anybody any credit, including myself. I don't know which of these I came up with. I have no idea. So number 11. Most writers enjoy hearing or reading what readers have to say about their own work. That is to say, poets generally prefer to hear your understanding of their work rather than hearing readers reiterate what the poets may or may not have already said about their own work. In essence, then, the meaning behind a poem is by far broader and deeper than the writer's intentions. That's the nature of poetry. This goes back to also something that uh, was said earlier. Interpreting a work of poetry or a work of literature by author intentions limits a reader's interpretation of that poem. You're limiting creativity. The poem often has much more to offer than author intentions. There are often times when an author, I know what's happened to me as an author, somebody sees something in a poem, I go, wow, I never noticed that. It does happen. It just came out in the poem as I was writing. I never noticed it, and some people have pointed it out. And there it is. It is there. There's nothing you can do about it. Did I intend it? No. But I'm glad it's there, and I'm glad somebody found it and pointed it out to me. We're also on the same vein, because it, it follows through with a couple of other principles coming through. We're going to watch a an excerpt of an interview with uh, Quentin Tarantino, the person doing the interview is called Charlie Rose. And this was an interview done in 2009, August of 2009. Here Tarantino is talking about his own work and how he feels about other people's understanding of his work. So we'll listen to that clip now. So that's one of my things, whether or not the audience knows about it, I know about the character's past, and I just want the actors to know. Now, the audience doesn't need to know. Like, for instance, uh, Brad Pitt's character, Aldo, Aldo Rain, has a, a rope burn exactly. around his neck. But I never want to explain what how, I, how I happened. I desperately wanted to know. Well, I want to just figure it out, all right? I mean, it's, it's up to you to, to supply where that rope burn came from. I mean, I would love to have had a, a little bit of a conversation mm -hmm. that he would have referred to that. Yes, I, I, if I wanted you to know, I would have told you. I like the idea so, that but, but your idea of cinema, then, is to keep a lot of stuff in. You want mystery in the film itself. You, know, it's like you the, want us not to yeah. know everything. Well, I like the idea. I like the idea that, if, okay, if, if you contemplate why there is a rope burn there, and yeah. somebody else contemplates why there is a rope burn there, and somebody else contemplates it, and three different people come up with three different uh, reasons why he got a rope burn, those are three different movies you all saw. 
saw. And I like that idea. I like the idea that you opened up the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, and I don't tell you what's in there, but it's up to you to figure out what's in there, and now that's your movie. And you'll make that decision somewhere down the line. Now, if I tell you at this table what it is, then you'll throw that away, and I don't want you to throw away. That's your movie. So there you have it. Tarantino is encouraging the principles of the intentional fallacy in regards to his movies. And as I argued before, it applies to visual art, sculpture as well, and to some degree to interpreting classical music, jazz, and song lyrics. All right, let's go on. Number 12. Even if an author did say, this is what I intended, it doesn't matter because authors have been known to lie about their work. Okay, let me give you an example. Since I'm also a musician, this was uh, something I learned in one of my music courses when I was in university. Uh, Igor Stravinsky, who wrote the famous The Rite of Spring Ballet, he wrote this, and it was a beautiful piece early in the 20th century and highly regarded immediately. It opens with a beautiful solo on the bassoon. I encourage you to take the time when you're done here, go listen to the opening of the Rite of Spring. It'll be on YouTube somewhere. This beautiful bassoon solo, though, is, is very modern, and it was especially for the ears of the first people who played it. Just a very modern-sounding melody for them. So what I understand is that one, the, the, the ballet was touring with Igor Stravinsky there to help musicians to understand this very modern work for the time. The bassoonist asked Igor Stravinsky about that solo and said, how did you want that played? Did you want to play it like this? And he plays it. Or did you want to play it like this? And he plays it again in a different way. And Stravinsky essentially said that whichever way you prefer, it sounds great both ways. Go ahead and play it. Not long later, another bassoonist in another town said, uh, Mr. Stravinsky, when you wrote this, uh, this solo, did you mean this? And he played it in the opposite way that the first bassoonist did. And Stravinsky said, yes, that is precisely what I meant. So Stravinsky was lying. He told one bassoonist, yes, that's good. Play it that way. That's what I wanted. He told another person, yes, play it that way, which is a different way. That's what I wanted. Play it that way. The important thing in both cases is that play it the way you interpret it. Interpret my work is what he was saying. So, yes, he was lying, but he was lying for a purpose. He wasn't trying to deceive anyone. He just didn't want to get in the debate of forget what I want. Just play it. Because then he would uh, that would actually end up making the musician more uncomfortable, I think, depending on the musician. I know as a musician myself, if I were playing and the composer were there, I would be very concerned as a musician. As a poet, I wouldn't be. But as a musician, I would be because I'm just a novice musician. I'm a very good novice, but just a novice. On the other hand, I play double bass, and uh, a, a famous uh, composer named Rachmaninoff, Sergei Rachmaninoff, wrote a piece called Vocalese. And he wrote it originally for vocal, for voice. But he did his own uh, arrangement of this piece for double bass. And so it was the first variation of this piece, the first arrangement. Rachmaninoff did it himself. And it was arranged for a, a bass player named Kusevitsky to play. Kusevitsky was also Russian, like Rachmaninoff. And... During the rehearsals of playing this, Kusevitsky was playing it, he interpreted a phrase in such a way that Rachmaninoff said, no, 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 don't play it that way, play it this way. And Kusevitsky said, no, I understand what you're saying, but that's not how I hear the piece. I hear it this way. I'm going to play it my way. The two of them had such a disagreement over it that they were never seen together again uh, as, as composer and musician. They didn't like each other after that because Kusevitsky was determined, rightfully so, to interpret the music as he saw fit because he was a musician. And he wasn't going to bow to Rachmaninoff's own interpretation. And he was right to do so. 
And he did so on stage before a live studio audience. He played this beautiful piece by Rachmaninoff called Vocalese. They never saw each other again, but Rachmaninoff's interpretation was not honored in that performance. And I salute Kusevitsky for that. Okay, enough on that one. My goodness, I can talk a lot. Number 13. Relying on author intentions for interpretation severely limits the breadth and depth that any one poem, regardless of quality, may have to offer readers. I think we've already talked about that in the previous principle. This is just another way of saying the same thing. Let the reader have his or her own discretion. Let the reader go. Let the musician go. Let the viewer of the art go. The interpretation is their own. Number 14. New insights on a work of art are found with the emphasis away from artists' intentions. In fact, and this is also an example, Aristotle observed that readers of poetry often have more to say about a given poem than the poet does. So in other words, if the poet is only going to say, yeah, I wrote this, and can maybe talk about it for 30 seconds, critics, readers, admirers of poetry can talk about it for hours and give a variety of different understandings. That's the beauty of poetry. That's the beauty of art. Number 15. Once a work of art is published, it is up to the readers, the viewers, or the listeners, depending on what art form we're talking about, to interpret for themselves. The work of art stands independent and autonomous from the artist, author, composer, sculptor, painter. His intentions and even his own interpretation, author intentions, are irrelevant when enjoying art of any genre. In fact, author intentions are nothing more than another interpretation, no more valid or less valid than anybody else's interpretation. Number 16. The author intentions, if you have access to them, which you likely never will have, are merely the author's interpretation of his work, and they are no more or less valid than your own interpretation. It may be interesting to know, back to Robert Frost's poem again, but it is irrelevant for creating your own interpretation. Number 17, very important principle here. You cannot discern author's intent from a single work. Familiarity with a large body of an author's work may help you to see some trends in his or her work, but nothing conclusive. It's all subjective. This will come into play later when we talk uh, about number 20 of these principles. But still, uh, it's the same thing. Work of art, the poem, is independent. You can't infer anything about the author from the poem. The poem stands on its own. Number 18. To interpret based on author intentions is not to interpret but to be told what a poem means. It is to interpret what the author has said about his own work, not what the work might actually say. Any regard for author intentions in interpretation is a denial of interpretation, because a person's interpretation of any work in any genre of the arts is that person's unique understanding of the work. I hope that speaks for itself. And it goes back to Tarantino as well. You know, if, if you think this is in the briefcase, you think that's in the briefcase, you think that's in the briefcase, all three different things by three different people, that's three different movies. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. It comes from Tarantino himself, whose movies I admire a great deal, by the way. Number 19. The readers, especially young or inexperienced readers, put far too much undue pressure on themselves by trying to understand a work of art in any genre in light of the artist's intentions. Art is for our enjoyment. Don't take away from that enjoyment by trying to do what is impossible even for seasoned critics. In other words, 
it, it, it's, it's very natural, it seems, to do. But when a young person or an inexperienced reader comes to a poem, they, it's like they are afraid to express their own ideas about the poetry. Well, it depends on what the critic meant. No, it doesn't. Feel free to express your own ideas. That's the whole point. I think I should have maybe started with this one because it's that important. People seem to automatically do this, and it doesn't matter what genre of the arts it is. They naturally do this. They go, well, it depends on what the composer meant. No, it doesn't. Interpret. Do it. You know, well, it depends on what the painter meant when he painted this, this famous painting. No, it doesn't. Interpret for yourself. That's what it's all about. That's part of the art. Number 20. <sighs> I dedicated this last episode to my friend Jeremy Barnhart because he had died just a week prior to me recording that episode. I am at this point very glad that I did dedicate that episode rather than this one. And I'm very glad regarding this principle here very glad that I made a distinction between this principle and the other principles in episode two. When it came to the intentional fallacy, Jeremy hated it, absolutely hated it. And we had more than one raised voices discussion about it because he was wrong. It's that simple. And I stand by that. Of course, he says the same, he, he would say the same thing but Jeremy's concern was that some reader might reach conclusions about him based on his writing if an interpretation did not include his own intentions. If, in other words, if a song Jeremy wrote did not include Jeremy's intentions, some listener of his songs or some other singer of his songs might reach a conclusion about Jeremy that Jeremy would find offensive or insulting or bad or wrong. My response to him was that if a reader reaches conclusions about the author, about Jeremy, based on Jeremy's work, the reader isn't interpreting the work at all. That's Interpreting the work is not reaching conclusions about the author. That's not the same thing. Interpreting the work stays with the work. What the reader is doing instead is doing the very thing that any writer would want to avoid. When you read my stuff, assuming that you do or have or will, I don't want you to reach conclusions about me. You might be able to reach some very general and vague conclusions. Okay, AJ seems to be a religious person. Um, AJ seems to love science and art. AJ likes to write narrative poems, maybe. First of all, you don't really know that those conclusions are true, and you're only basing them on a large body of my work. But they, it might be true, but you don't know, and you never will, unless you come up and ask me, hey, AJ, are you a religious person? Well, I'm not going to answer that necessarily. Infer for yourself. So that's principle number 20. That was Jeremy's main concern. We never did settle that. We remained very good friends, don't misunderstand me. But that was one point of contention between us. We just never were able to conclude that. I would like to mention another example based on this very thing, though. I wrote a poem called The Photo. Um, it was published in my first book of poetry, as a matter of fact. And what I wanted to do in this poem was demonstrate the idea that it's not as beneficial to a person to take a picture of a memorable event. It's better to set the camera aside and absorb the event because if you're busy taking a picture of your child's first grade Christmas play, for example, and you're busy filming it and taking pictures and whatever the case may be, your memory is going to be more about the pictures you took rather than of the event itself. That's what I was trying to say in this poem. It didn't turn out that way at all. It's a great poem. I love the poem the way it is. It's a great poem. But it's not what I intended. It has nothing to do with what I intended. See, the thing is, a work of art knows what it wants to be. And I'm quoting my professor, Dr. Mary Pryor, here. 
She was one of my literature teachers and one of my creative writing teachers back at Moorhead State University in Minnesota. It's now known as Minnesota State University Moorhead. She said that a work of art knows what it wants to be before you set pen to paper, instrument to music, or brush to canvas. I remember her saying that, and I thought that, you know, that because I at that point I had already seen that happen. The, the, the poem knows what it's going to do, and the poem will guide you. Tarantino says that in the same interview, just a different segment. He says, you know, I, the character I want to write tells me what it's going to write. I don't have the power to say, no, you can't do that. It's an amazing phenomenon, and it's true. The, the work of art knows what it wants to be. And in this case, the poem, the photo, came out to say something completely different. The speaker in the poem was taking a picture of his daughter in ballet, and he's speaking to a friend about the photo. And you expect that this father is going to talk about his daughter and how great she was and so on. Instead, he ends up talking about the photo itself and how much effort he put into capturing that one photo and, and, and how he tried. And he's really proud of how that, that picture turned out, forgets his daughter altogether. I think that's tragic, but that's not what I intended at all. It's not even close. So that's another reason that artist intentions are utterly irrelevant. Okay, last principle here. This one I'm going to read, it's all my own, and I consider this something of my own mic drop here. Principle number 21. An essay is an opinion. While it is true that you, as the writer of an essay, are trying to assert your opinion as though it were fact, the truth remains that you are putting forth your own opinion in the essay that you write. That is the very nature of writing an essay in which you interpret a poem, any other essay as well. You're putting forth an idea that you are trying to prove. That is the very nature of writing an essay in which you interpret a poem, other literary work, or work of art in any other genre. You are expressing your opinion, your understanding or interpretation of that work. What has the author's opinions to do with your opinion? Nothing. If you value the supposed intentions of the author in the work you are interpreting, you may certainly do so. But those intentions of the author or artist must have no effect whatsoever on your opinion, understanding, or interpretation of that work. And you are entitled to your opinion so long as it is supported by the text that you are critiquing. Your job in such an essay is to express your very own, individual, unimpeded understanding. That's what you do in an essay, especially if you're writing about a work of literature. This is your opinion. That's the essence of an essay. You state it as though it's a fact. That's a principle of an essay. That's how you write about literature. You write your understanding. Forget what the author intended altogether. I would like to, before I close, share one more story with you. And I, I love this story. If you uh, are interested in reading it, um, it was put in my book called Dear Stuart Writes AJ. Now that book is coming out in a new edition in 2023 by summer. But that story is still in there in two parts. It's called Literary Interpretation, part one and part two. But in this story, in part one, a friend of mine was became a student. He became my friend after he graduated from my class. His name is Craig. At the beginning of the class, when the class started, I told my students that when they're writing an essay about a work of literature, they forget author intentions. As long as their understanding is supported by the text, their understanding is valid and good. I told them that. Now, Craig was in this class. He didn't agree with me. And uh, we started this little discussion on that. Um, it didn't go anywhere. A few weeks later, we were discussing the poem by Robert Frost called Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. And so we were talking about this in the class, and the discussion wasn't really going anywhere. 
But Craig finally raised his hand and said, this poem is about Santa Claus. And yeah, I was a little bit surprised because this is normally interpreted as a very somber poem, a poem about depression, sadness, sorrow, solitude. Uh, and here it was, he, this young man was said it was about Santa Claus. I said, okay, prove it to me. And we went through that poem, stanza by stanza, and he proved it. And everybody was kind of amazed by this interpretation because it was something of a shock to the system. So, yeah, I, I was surprised as well. But it was a valid interpretation. It was supported by the text. He proved that. He proved that it was supported by the text. So, valid interpretation. So I went on in other classes after that saying, hey, when you interpret a poem, you can do what this guy did in my class. He took this poem and said it was about this and blah, 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 completely different interpretation. He could publish a paper on this. And uh, so I was encouraging students based on this very incident to interpret on their own ideas without author intentions. <laughs> well, Craig and I became friends after this class and then he eventually moved from Prince George, where I was teaching at the time, at the College of New Caledonia. He, he moved to Nanaimo. And a few years later, after I realized that I was all alone up there without any family, Prince George is a long ways from anything. It's not on the way to anywhere. I decided to move closer to my family. So I didn't want to move so close to my family that I was looking over their shoulders or that they would feel that way. So I moved to Nanaimo which is about an hour away from where everybody else lives. And that's exactly where Craig had moved. And that's one of the reasons I chose Nanaimo is that Craig had moved here. And that's where I live now. Well, the first summer that I was here, Craig and I went to a pub called the Crow and Gate. And if you're ever in Nanaimo, I strongly suggest you visit the Crow and Gate. It's a marvelous little uh, English style pub good food, good beer. Anyway, they have seats outside and, and uh, uh, around picnic tables. And so Craig and I took a picnic table and eventually some other people joined us. And uh, we were talking, of course, by then I had a little bit of a buzz. Um, I had, it was hot and I had had two beers. And I seen, I don't know if it happens to other people, but when I'm drinking in the heat, I feel the alcohol more quickly. So we started talking about how we had met with these people we had just met at the Crow and Gate. We started talking about how Craig and I had met. And I we told them this story about this poem, <laughs> Stopping by Woods in a Snowy Evening. And Craig, <laughs> Craig got very upset, and I didn't know why. He told me, though, he, it turns out that he didn't know that I had <laughs> used that as a positive example in other classes, a, a positive example of, of interpreting on your own without author intentions. He had no idea that I'd been doing that. And uh, he was mad about that. He was actually very angry. And it turns out that he it was angry because he hadn't really interpreted that poem that way. He was testing me. You see, so when he knew that we were going to discuss that poem the night before he, we were discussing it, he went online and looked for the most absurd and inane interpretation he could get. And he brought that to class to share. This interpretation wasn't even his own. And, he, and so he shared it in class, trying to get me to backpedal. And I didn't. And so he was mad at first that I hadn't backpedaled, so his, his little test hadn't worked. I, I failed it by passing it, as far as I'm concerned. But then that I had been using this incident as a positive example for why you should ignore author intentions made him angry. And, uh, and that was just hilarious. He and Jeremy also became friends in fact, they may have become friends before I did. I'm not exactly sure how that worked. But he and Jeremy would, would sometimes gang up on me to discuss the intentional fallacy because neither of them agreed with it. They were both wrong. It's that simple. They were both wrong. 
anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. I think it's still funny today. If you'd like to read about it, uh, Dear Stuart Writes AJ is coming out in a new edition in the spring of 2023. Um, I'll let you know when it's available. So, how do you read a poem? You forget what the author may or may not have intended. You just enjoy the poem. You don't worry about poetic devices, although they're good to know later on. And we will talk about them in this podcast. You don't worry about them when you're first enjoying a poem. Enjoy the poem. Learn to like it. Forget what the author intended. It's your poem when you're reading it. Not that you're the author, but it's still your poem. That's how you read a poem. You enjoy it. That's what it's for. Now, I'm going to read two poems as, as a way of concluding. The first one of these, I want to share with you another principle. Um, this is a, a poem called Love's First Kiss at Parting by Robert Burns, the famous Scottish poet from the 1700s. Um, he didn't live to be very old, just a little over 40 years. Looks like 46 years. This is one of my favorite poems, and I will probably talk about it, the same poem for other purposes later, but I'll read it, and then I want to talk about it and why it's important for this episode. So this is called Love's First Kiss at Parting. Humid seal of soft affections, tenderest pledge of future bliss, dearest tie of young connections, love's first snowdrop, virgin kiss. Speaking silence, dumb confession, passion's birth and infant's play, dove-like fondness, chaste concession, glowing dawn of future day. Sorrowing joy, a dew's last action. Lingering lips must now disjoin. What words can ever speak affection so thrilling and sincere as thine? This was one of my favorite poems for a number of years before I started teaching this particular one in a college course, again, in Prince George at the College of New Caledonia. And we read it in class, and you've got to keep in mind, I love this poem. I have since the first time I read it, and I thought I knew everything about this poem there was to know. And so we started talking about it in class again, and one student, um, older than average, I'm guessing she was somewhere around 30, offered her interpretation of the poem. And she said, well, the, the kiss isn't really a kiss. The kiss is the actual, actually the first relationship. And I was blown away, absolutely dumbfounded by the profundity of this interpretation. I remember my jaw dropping, my eyes popping, and I actually found myself falling backwards on the table I was sitting on. It, was, it blew me away that much. I was absolutely dumbfounded. Now, what she was doing was she was using a type of symbol called synecdoche. You have synecdoche when a part of something represents the whole of something. So when you say all hands on deck, you're not talking about people's hands being, you know, cut off their bodies and thrown onto the deck of a ship. You're talking about the people coming up onto the deck. That's synecdoche. Same thing here. A kiss is a part of an intimate relationship. And so she was using that kiss as synecdoche. And so we talked about it, just like we did with uh, with Craig's interpretation of stopping by woods on a snowy evening. So we said, okay, let's take the poem apart, see if the poem supports your interpretation. And humid seal of soft affection, well, that works just fine. It's not necessarily humid. Um, you know, it's just soft affections is what really comes to mind. A humid seal, well, people are not exactly dry. We, we, we are humid types of beings, humid human beings. 
that type of thing. Tenderest pledge of future bliss. Dearest tie of young connections. Love's first no snowdrop. Virgin kiss. So we're talking about people who are young, innocent, virginal, and this is their relationship. It seems to work. Speaking silence. You know how you can be with someone you love and not say anything and still be comfortable with that? That's the type of thing. Then it's repeated in its opposite. Speaking silence, dumb confession. Passion's birth and infant's play. Again, we have this idea of youth and innocence, of, of uh, virginity, that all that kind of thing. Dove-like fondness, chaste concession, glowing dawn of future day. These are more beautiful images. For the most part, they seem to congeal. At least we thought so then. We went on to the last stanza, sorrowing joy. Ah, okay. So this was their relationship as they broke up. And that's what she said. I may have said that wrong, so I apologize. This is their first relationship. The kiss is the relationship, but this is their relationship as they break up. Sorrowing joy, adieu's last action. Lingering lips must now disjoin. Okay, it's the end of the relationship. Here's the problem. What words can ever speak affection so thrilling and sincere as thine? Now, her contention was that this poem was about the relationship and the end of that relationship. But how many times does the end of an intimate relationship speak of affection or something thrilling? It might be sincere, but that's not a thrilling moment. That does not speak of affection. So people started to furrow their brows at that point. Then we went back and we looked at the second line. Tenderest pledge of future bliss. No, if you're breaking up, that doesn't work. Speaking silence, dumb confession in the second stanza. Passion's birth and infant's play. Dove-like fondness, chaste concession. All that works. Glowing dawn of future day. Now, wait a minute. If it's the end of a relationship, you're not going to compare it to a glowing dawn and a future day. Unless you really, really, really hate this person. But the poem does not support that idea at all either. And she didn't agree that it would be a, a, a bad breakup. This was a nice breakup. It's, this was a kiss. This relationship was a kiss, she thought. And it, 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 uh, it may be the end of the kiss, but it was still a pleasant experience. So glowing dawn of future day is directly contradictory to that. And so as much as I was blown away by that interpretation when I first heard it and could see how it would work, on future discussion, we had to reject her interpretation because the text doesn't support it. I needed to emphasize that to show you an example of an interpretation that just simply does not work. Um, it's contrasted nicely with Craig's story. You have an interpretation of a poem that is completely out of the blue, and yet it did seem to work. So that is the poem by Robert Burns, Love's First Kiss at Parting. With the last poem that I'm going to read called The Georges by a man whose name is Walter Savage Landar. Who would name their kid Savage? I've never understood that. But that's this guy's middle name. I want to share with you a little bit of how I read a poem, especially after I've gotten to know it quite well. What I try to do, especially if I'm having fun with the poem, is I try to speak the way the speaker might actually speak. So I make any poem an act of drama. So this poem called The Georges, very short six-line poem, funny as can be in my mind. And it's about four kings in the English monarchy, one after another, um, King George I from 1714 to 1727, then King George II, from 1727 to 1760, King George III, 1760 to 1820, and then King George IV, 
1820 to 1830 when Queen Victoria took the throne. Uh, this is a long, long time for King George, even though it's four Georges. Uh, it's, it's a long time for them to reign. The author died in 1864, so he did not live to see King George V come to the throne. That was Victoria's son. So he was writing about the first four Georges as we know them, the only Georges as he knew them. And this is the poem called The Georges, and I just am reading this to show you how I read a poem. George. George the first was always reckoned vile, but viler George the second. And what mortal ever heard any good of George the third? When from the earth the fourth descended, God be praised, the Georges ended. So I try to take on a character when I read it. And in this reading, I try to imitate a little bit of Winston Churchill and a little bit of John Houseman and try to come up with a persona that way. That's how I read a poem, and I have a lot of fun doing that. And I want you to notice also, in light of the previous episode on how to read a poem, I didn't pause after the first line. George I was always reckoned vile, comma, but viler George II, semicolon, which is very similar to a period. So I paused there. And what mortal ever heard any good of George III? Question mark. No pause between those two lines, but a nice long pause after third. When from the earth the fourth descended, now, in my characterization, the persona had trouble coming up with descended, because that's actually saying that the fourth George went to hell. He descended from earth, that is, he died and went to hell. So he had trouble saying that, so I paused before descended. And then, in parentheses, I paused before and after the phrase, God be praised. And then, the Georges ended, giving the two last words their special emphasis. So that was my use of Seshura. I wanted to review that from the previous episode to show you how, can, how it can apply to a poem when you're reading it and when you're enjoying it. So there are some uh, links in the comments section below the video. One for the uh, each of the two articles that I cited, uh, Wimsot and Beardsley and Mambrol, Nazrula Mambrol, I hope I'm pronouncing that somewhat correctly. You can also see the link for the interview with Quentin Tarantino that I cited and showed you an excerpt of. Those are in the link below, so go ahead and check those out as you wish. I'd like to thank you for your attention during this episode. I had a lot of fun recording it. I do strongly believe in this principle. If you have questions or, or arguments against it, share them with me. I'll see what I can do to talk to you about it, as long as we don't take it on you know, for ages and ages and ages and, dis and discuss it that way. As I'm closing, I'd like to remind you to please like this video, and by that I actually mean please click the button that says like, because it doesn't help me if you just think, gee, I really like that video, and not click the button. Uh, clicking the button helps. As much as I'm glad you liked it, it helps me a lot if you actually click the button. And don't forget to like us also on uh, Facebook and soon on MeWe. I'm also going to have a website there. Please, if you like poetry or just like what you're learning here, be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon so you get updates whenever I upload a new video. And then, of course, You've got to share it as well. Share it to Facebook, share it to uh, TikTok, share it to wherever you want to share it to. Please feel free to share, especially though to those friends who are new to poetry and love it or just love poetry even though they're old to it. Thank you very much. Have a great couple of weeks. Episode four will be up shortly. It will be all of you. Thank you very much. Take care. God bless. We'll talk to you later.